Welcome to another virtual FOSS North event. Big thanks to our sponsors and partners. Make my screen go away and replace it with slides, which I think you guys can now see. And let me go full screen. And great. So uh, today I'd really like to talk to you a bit about um, a project I'm working on called Precursor. And the idea of this project is to facilitate what I call evidence-based trust for uh, secure mobile computation. Um, and so, you know, getting into this, let's start with the, the basic question of do you trust your computer? If you do, why? Or if you don't, why not? Right? If we think about the trust problem in software, we have a bit of a bias to perhaps think that more open things are more trustable. But you know, why is that? Is it because you know in open source we can actually read the source thoroughly and check it every single time there's a release of you know, you know, Chrome or Firefox, we check all those lines, or that we could actually compile our browsers from source before we use them? You know, actually there's not enough time in the day to do that. And the reason why um, we feel more trustable in this type of software is that they're actually evidence-based tools that we can use to transfer trust between different stages of, of the development process. So we have things like hashing and public keys and Merkle trees, which is what Git is based off of to try and transfer trust. So, you know, hashing, just to recall, you know, takes a big pile of bits and turns into a short sequence of symbols so that a tiny change inside the file itself will make a big change in the output symbol. So it's very obvious that someone's tampered with something with a hash, and it's also very hard to tamper with it in a way that creates the same set of symbols. And signing then allows us to take that, that set of symbols, that shorthand for what should be in the file, and encrypt it so that we can't tamper with the signature at the end of the day. And so the key point is that uh, you know, in software, you know, we have this ability uh, to transfer trust so that the place of check is near the user. So we have, you know, in sort of the, the software development cycle, maybe we have some developers who are in the community, maybe you even know some of them, and they're working in Git, and they, they use Merkle trees to go ahead and keep, make sure that everything is, you know, attached to a commit. It then goes to the cloud and some build infrastructure. We don't even know who's there. It could be some, some malicious people who even run that. But, you know, as long as th someone's checking the output of that and signing it, that person can then sign that build, send it to a CDN that we don't trust, download it into different stages also that we don't trust until we finally get to the RAM on our CPU. And then we can go ahead and actually check that the, the software going to run matches what the developer intended right at the place of use. And because it's open source, we can have auditors who then take the copies of stuff that are downloaded and you know, check them against builds and say, okay, everything's checking out. So we have this way to transfer trust in software. The problem with evidence-based trust in hardware is that it's actually a, a talk to problem. It's a time of check to time of use problem all the way through the hardware supply chain. And so just to sort of think through what this means, let's imagine, you know, for example, we have you, and you know there are a class of things like even after you've checked everything you have evil made so maybe you've you know checked your computer and then you know someone can go ahead and modify your computer after you've checked it let's not worry quite about that one yet um, but let's worry a little bit more about more common scenarios for example like you're getting something from a distributor and it goes through a courier right and so you've you you have reason to trust maybe that the person selling you the computer is selling you a good computer, but now it, it's you know it's gone through a third party, a truck or something like that. Um, and unfortunately, we have actual evidence that there are government programs to go ahead and intercept packages and put implants inside of them on route between you know a vendor and uh, a customer, right? Um, let's say you know we trust all those things. Well, we have the problem of like returns and exchanges. Other customers actually, because of the way our sort of logistics work today with Amazon and all the online buying, is that people can buy something, tamper with it, put it back in a box with the tamper evidence seals in place, and then return it back. And so now they may not be able to direct a particular malicious package at you specifically, but they have a good chance of targeting people in a region. So you could imagine a distributor that is near the data center or the knock may you may, you may have someone being paid to buy things tamper with them return them into the, into the into the system so you can try and get an implant closer to the point of uh, of, of interest and you know 
there's some actually really interesting talks about you know how this happens, uh, particularly in the in the sort of the the Bitcoin wallet space. You know, attempts to remove um, uh, these tamper event stickers to replace them, and it also it just turns out the tamper event stickers are actually very easy to get printed uh, and make them look new. Plus, oftentimes customers don't even know what they look like, so as long as it's shiny and it says you know warranty void if removed, they'll probably accept it. Um, so then that sort of illustrates sort of like the, the close area issues, but then we also have sort of the, the geopolitical cross boundary issues of like, we have a factory which may not be in your locale. And of course, things that come into your country go through a customs inspection, right? So there's a perfect opportunity there for some type of interception or some kind of tampering with, um, you know, the hardware en route to, to your local supply chain. So if we go ahead and, and cut to the chase and sort of expand this all the way back. So, you know, on, on the lower right here, there's you hanging out. You have a courier distributor, goes through customs. There's a factory, but behind the factory is this enormous network of other suppliers that you don't see and don't normally look into, but you have distributors who sell parts to the factory. You have circuit board assembly. You have people who are designing the product. You have chip design mass prep chip fab, and then you have these gray markets that operate behind factories to help facilitate, you know, what happens if you, uh, you know, order uh, a million units, but you only sell 900,000, do they throw away 100,000 units? No, they, have, they end up in the gray market and people end up, you know, trading them through, with each other, right? That's just a part of uh, business that exists, that is very opaque behind this whole system. So there's a big attack surface where things can go wrong in terms of trying to get trusted chips and trusted components into the supply chain. So the question is, you know, can open source save us? Like, so if we go ahead and we say, now I've added to this picture in the lower left, developers who are contributing ideas to Git and, and then sticking them on the left-hand side here and then working it through the, you know, the supply chain to, till it gets to the consumer. The problem ultimately with just using open source to solve the hardware problem is that the place of check is too far from the place of use. So, you know, you can have your CI checks in the cloud, you can have an open, physical design kit for the chip design, you can have open PCB designs, but then you're trusting this whole supply chain, customs distributors, other customers, to make sure that things come to you without being tampered with. Um, you know, I've heard proposals like, oh, let's let's build a trustable factory. Like, you know, let's let's go ahead and put something on EU soil that, you know, is is is, you know, we watch over it and make sure that it's all approved and and we don't have any sort of uh, you know potential for all this gray market stuff going on and some open test infrastructure, whatever it is. The problem is you still haven't solved the problem of distributors and couriers and other customers and returns and exchanges, that sort of thing. So ultimately, this stems from the fact that you can't hash hardware. We don't have a hash function that we can run at home on the hardware we receive like we can run on the files we download from the internet and check them against signatures to make sure that they're any good. So hardware is you know, one huge time of check to time of use problem. So I've, I'm on record saying that, but you can always get a bigger microscope. This is from the standpoint of like people trying to hide secrets in hardware and keys and whatnot. And I always say like, look, you know, you know, secrecy in hardware doesn't really work because I can always get a microscope that can pull the secret out, right? And there are technologies like a tychographic x-rays, um, which are non-destructive, which is good, so you're not destroying the chip. They're, they can do 3D imaging of very complex chips, and they're really good for reverse engineering and verification. There's a link to, if you want to read more about it in a Nature article here. The catch is that the microscope is literally the size of a building. This is, uh, I think this is in Switzerland. Um, and th this donut-shaped thing here is is a building which is the light source for the microscope that is capable of doing that right so it's not something you're going to be able to just put next to your house i mean maybe you could but like i don't think most people can and uh and and use it to inspect your chips so now you have this problem of we can send maybe chips to this microscope to check but then you're once again back in the courier problem of you know now it has to maybe go through customs because the microscope isn't in your same country has to go through a courier and then gets delivered to you. So you can have a time of check to time of use problem. The second problem is that actually checking one chip only checks one chip, right? The, 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 you wouldn't say, okay, I'm just going to download a file once, you know, from the internet and and check hash check it and say, okay, all the future downloads will be okay, right? So, you know, but then in hardware, people are like, well, let's just take samples of chips take them apart and look on the inside and confirm that there's no implants on this one sample of a chip. I mean, 
it's the exact same problem. Just because you've checked one sample out of a million that had, says nothing about the other 999,999 you know, parts out there. Um, and so random sampling is just not actually effective. So you know, when you, when, you, when you want to implement a checking program, a thorough one, it has to be on 100% of the units going to uh, critical points of use. So then, OK, you know, I've sort of painted a semi bleak picture of, 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 of sort of the, the, the hardware trust issue. And the question is, can we build an evidence based case to trust our computers, you know, in the face of things like, you know, this nominal article that Bloomberg put out, which, you know, you can argue about the veracity of it or not. But, you know, the a lot of the facts on the inside are absolutely technically true. Uh, whether it happened or not is, 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 you know, we can't say for sure because we don't actually have the instance of the device. Uh, but, you know, there's also, you know, these pages from the Snowden files about, you know, uh, literally, you know, cables with implants on the inside of them that can go ahead and exfiltrate data um, that looks exactly like a regular USB cable or Ethernet cable or, or e Ethernet mag jack that would go into a computer. So um, I've been thinking a lot about this, and uh, I think I've kind of managed to reduce, if you really cared about evidence-based trust, there are three principles I think they're important to embody um, to to fix this problem. First is is that um, you know com complexity is the enemy of verification. Second is that we should verify entire systems and not just individual components. And finally, we really need to make sure that end users are empower empowered to do the verification and not just you know certification agencies or third parties or whatever it is. So like we'll spend the next few minutes sort of going through what each of these lines implies, right? So when I say that we have complexity is the enemy of verification, it's that literally, you know, phones are built out of a bazillion parts today. Um, if you wanted to verify that every part of a phone is correct, it's actually pretty hard and it's almost a destructive process because they have glue seals and everything, and, and it's a it's it's pretty difficult. And so there's a trade-off we have to make in terms of, okay, we really want to trust something, but we also have to um, be able to realistically verify what's inside of it. And one way to do that is to reduce the attack surface you have to verify, reduce it to the core function that you really care about for security and not you know, necessarily put in all the features for taking, I don't know, beautiful pictures of, 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 of your food or whatever it is uh, at the table. That's great, but maybe you don't need that high level of trust for all those features all the time. Um, of course, if we go away from these complicated, you know, systems that we have today, these supercomputers in our pocket, um, we can go say, okay, well, let's just build a 6502 or something from discrete transistors. This has been done. A friend of mine, he built the Monster 6502. Uh, it's literally a circuit board that has a transistor level implementation of the 6502. It's an 8-bit uh, CPU from, you know, 20 some odd years ago, 30 odd years ago. Um, you know, it's trivial to verify that's been built correctly because you can literally see the transistors with your own eyes. The problem is, is it runs at a 50 kilohertz clock rate, right? You're not going to really be able to do a lot with it. Um, and OK, so let's say we just say, let's not go so extreme that we're building it out of little discrete transistors. Let's build a processor out of a node that you can inspect with a microscope without having to get an electron microscope. A regular light microscope can do it. Well, the problem is photons are big. They're like, you know, uh, 380 nanometers for blue light, and so maybe 500 nanometers, half a micron is what you're looking at for that type of process. Um, well, you know, that turns out to be about a 100 megahertz clock rate, you know, with a lot of power consumption. You know, we're, we're rolling the clock way, 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 way back to the 80s or 90s in terms of process technology. And, um, and you can maybe fit, uh, you know, a, a, a couple kilobytes per square millimeter in that piece of silicon. It's not going to be able to do a lot, right? So when we talk about sort of complexity being the enemy of verification and we want to do point of use verification, we have to think carefully about what features we're putting in and what people really need. So on the left hand side here, I have, you know, the, uh, you know, the latest iPod earphones or whatever it is. They probably have over 10 million, you know, 100 million transistors or something like this inside of it. Right. Um, it's got a lot of features. It's wireless and whatever it is. But on the on the right hand side, we have a functionally equivalent thing, which is like this little headset here. I, I it has exactly one transistor. It's used to bias the microphone on the inside, um, and you know everything else, like the the earphones, the pieces, they're just magnets and wires. You can go back to first principles and verify, right? And so here, 
we have a situation where on the left-hand side, we have a completely, you know, you could have a Bluetooth transmitter inside of a, a headphone that can transmit, you know, exfiltrate data, whatever it is, and you're never going to be able to have the time of the day to verify it. Um, and the loss of function that you get going to the right-hand side is you now have a cord that comes out of the wire and it's a bit bigger, you know, you can't really carry it in your pocket, right? But but if you really care about trust and, and, and evidence-based trust in your hardware, the thing on the right-hand side it wins hands down in terms of being able to verify. So this is an example of what I mean in terms of sort of thinking about a complexity problem and reducing the attack surface. So that's the first point to sort of address. We have to sort of, you know, think about exactly what we're building and reduce the attack surface. Um, the second point is that I think we need to think about it from a system standpoint, and not just component standpoint. So um, if you look inside your phone right now, actually you have a device, which is a, like most of them have this little secure enclave on the inside, which keeps all of your keys on the inside uh, and not, they don't keep it inside your main CPU because it could be hacked. There's a lot of, you know, it, uh, you know, it's a big attack surface there. Uh, the problem is, is that you have like this secure IO problem. So even though if you keep your keys inside the security enclave, the stuff that you type and the stuff that goes to the screen is still visible and scrapable. So like anyone who's perhaps used Android may have noted that when you try to add a keyboard region, it says, literally it says, you know, this input method can collect all the data you type, including your personal data, like passwords and credit card numbers. And then, you know, I don't know if people even read it, they just click okay, right? You just you just sort of gave, you despite all the security you have, you just sort of gave the right to read everything that you type to a third party application to which you know very little about, right? So this is, this is a problem with, if we just said, okay, we're gonna solve the, the security enclave problem and build a chip that's secure, we, I don't think we've meaningfully moved the ball forward in terms of uh, trust, you know, being able to trust a piece of hardware with a secret. <clears throat> so that's the that's the second point. And the third point is is we need to empower end users to verify and seal their hardware. Um, so you know, people need to be able to, you know, in their own, at least ideally as close to home as possible. Maybe if you don't have the the technical capability yourself, you have a friend who can help you do this, right? verify at multiple levels what's going on inside the hardware so you know at the design level we can have open review of the design at the sort of board level we have guides that show us where things are and what they should look like and then you know at the chip level we have the the circuit you know you know principles available for us to sort of think about um, and ideally we can also sort of you know do something about that and in addition to that um, you know once it's verified users should be able to fully provision device and then seal the secrets on the inside um, and you know this this be, this is actually worth a bullet point because the problem is, uh, ironically, a lot of tools that we get for um, you know trustable hardware. If you ever have developed for like a, um, an SOC or like some embedded device, you can the the factories won't give you the source code for the thing that burns the keys into the device. You have to download a third party tool because they oftentimes keep it locked behind some JTAG door. The protocols aren't you know disclosed. It's not it's not, you know, so it's sort of a weird break in the whole idea of creating trust in the process. So, um, you know, so when I put the slide in here, it's actually speaking to a specific sort of endemic problem in the um, chip industry of not um, empowering people to put, you know, burn e-fuses on their devices. Um, <clears throat> and then ceiling can and maybe perhaps should be physical too, depending on your threat model. Uh, you may want to have some tamper resistance measures, so you want to be able to take you know, you know, perhaps a trusted domain of chips here and then put a metal can over it and glue on top of it. And that way, you know, it's a it's a very it's a crude way. It's a very simple way, but it's also actually surprisingly effective way to sort of at least know if someone's trying to tamper with your device because they have to remove that shield to get on the inside. It'll leave evidence and, they, and, and, and it raises the stakes on the physical security for a, a relatively small amount of effort. So. These are the three principles, like sort of like, you know, at a very high level uh, talking about, you know, some big ideas. But let's, you know, I've been trying to distill these ideas into an actual coherent product, I guess, if you will, uh, a project to try and figure out, you know, what does it mean to have verifiable hardware? So um, it's a device I call Precursor. And the name is chosen because it's it's literally a precursor. It's 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 a platform for people to sort of start building secure applications. Um, and it's designed to facilitate evidence-based trust. It's simple, simple in construction, 
It's open in design, and I hope it's sufficient in function to do some um, key applications. So what applications? Uh, I, I envision it maybe being used for secure text-based messaging, could be used for voice chat. Um, it, I'm designing it with multilingual capabilities, so it's not English only or even a, one particular style of language only, right? Um, uh, it's, I think it should be ideal for things like password management and crypto wallet, these sorts of things. Stuff it's explicitly not designed for, for example, is web browsing. Like the moment I feel like I throw a web browser into a device, I, f I, I, I don't feel like I can really necessarily trust it that much anymore. I mean, you know, web browsers naturally just pull down gobs of JavaScript and tries to run it on your device locally. And, and you know, and we know the number of sorts of escapes and, and exploits that have existed in these types of systems. Um, so I don't think it even makes sense from a security standpoint to, to include that in the scope. Um, it's not really designed for games, but you can do some retro gaming on it, um, you know, but it's, you know, that's not a thing that's in scope. And, you know, photos and videos, I think, are also a bit too hard for it to, to process at this point in time because you don't have good uh, solutions to, you know, cameras and video playback that doesn't uh, sort of um, expand the, extact, the, the, the attack surface too much. Um, so that's sort of like where, from the, from the functional standpoint, where I think it's going to sit. Um, but, you know, let's talk a bit about the construction. I say it's, it's simple in construction. So a lot of phones, you know, you've seen maybe some teardowns of them. They have, you know, adhesives everywhere, and they're deliberately hard to take apart. This one's actually made to be taken apart and looked at. There's a, you know, a single main circuit board on the inside. It can come out. Um, you know, I use screws in the bezel to hold the bezel in place. Uh, the keyboard is, you know, everything is basically made um, so that it's, it's simple to, to take apart, simple to look at, easy to understand. Uh, so, for example, if you want to go ahead and verify the keyboard, uh, you know, we use a physical keyboard um, instead of a touchscreen keyboard because, you know, physical keyboards are visually inspectable, right? There's no silicon chips on the inside. If you want to be multilingual, we have to do the, the old school way, which is we take out an overlay and we stick a new one on. You don't get to download one, unfortunately. You have to take some screws and do a little elbow grease. But you, but you can change out the overlay to your favorite language uh, with a screwdriver um, on a physical keyboard. So it's a trade off. But I think, you know, in terms of um, inspectability, this is like really trivial to inspect. You just hold up the circuit board to some light and we've actually selected the circuit board to be made out of this clear translucent material. So it's not, nothing's hidden. It's very easy to see all the way through. You can see, you know, in, in this picture here, we can see the traces, we can see the switches and we can see the connector, that's it, we're done, right? We, we know that there's nothing that can intercept um, the, the keystrokes. You know, opposed to, you know, for example, a touch keyboard, if you look, if we start to look at what goes inside these touchscreen controllers, they almost always use a microcontroller on the inside, which has a firmer blob, right? That's the, the people even talk about it. It just comes shipped inside the device. Um, you know, what, what's, what's going on inside this device? It's actually extremely hard to say, even if the touchscreen itself is, is not have some embedded login capability that can have an exfiltration path later on through the I squared C interface or whatever it is. Um, now let's talk about the screen. Uh, you know, I, I do worry about screen scrapers and screen grabbers, and so uh, I think it's important to have a, an ability for humans to directly see the things they're working on. And so we've picked a, a high DPI black and white screen. It's 200 DPI, 336 by 536 pixels. And the, the coolest feature about this, in my opinion, is that all the drive electronics are actually fabricated on glass. So what I have here, the picture on the right-hand side, is actually taken with an optical microscope at 50x zoom of the of the actual glass itself and you can see these here are individual logic gates that are that compose the address decoder uh inside the display and these bright spots here are the pixel elements of the display and there's a little hole in it where they i think it's where the drive transistor is and a little bit of light can come through uh, even though it, the the screen is off right um and so and so you can literally take this thing uh, and because it constructed the transistors directly in the glass using this amorphous TFT technology, um, you can just like sort of see what's going on. There's less things to verify um, and there's less things that need to check. So, for example, but then compared, for example, to a color LCD, virtually all LCDs of, of other construction incorporate an actual driver IC. So if you ever take apart an LCD and you actually strip off the backlight and whatnot, you'll see, and I've kind of put in red air here, you see this kind of bar 
that is underneath a piece of glue. If you flip it over and put a microscope, you'll see that it's actually a chip. There's a full-on silicon chip um, on the inside here that decodes the interface and has a whole frame buffer and a command interface. Um, it's actually quite powerful. It has a lot of state, and uh, you know who knows what could be on the inside. But that's a difficult piece again to verify. So that's so we, so we tried to make the screen also verifiable. Now, in terms of the PCB, um, the PCB itself, you know, was designed um, with security in mind and verifiability in mind. I have some um, diagrams we can, uh, I'll make them available online so people can look at it. But you know, this is calls out all the different features so that ideally, if you look at it, you're not guessing what something is like, okay, here's the TRNG and here's where the flash ROM is and here's where the, you know, SOC FPGA is and okay, these are the, the keyboard isolators and whatnot, right? So this, you, you, we, you know, we're trying to facilitate verification with, um, you know, uh, pictures like this. Um, but perhaps more meaningfully, uh, the PCB itself was designed along attack surface. So I also have a more logical diagram here I can show you of how it was designed. And so we have, the, we, we logically split the PCB into sort of two halves. One is I call the U domain, the untrusted domain, and the other one's called the T domain or the trusted domain. As the names imply, the T domain is where you keep your secrets, and the U domain is sort of like this interface, a firewall, if you will, to the to the outside world that you inevitably have to interface with. So, for example, in the U domain, we keep the actual um, internet interface. It's a Wi-Fi chip. It has a firmware blob. We don't care, right? It's it's, it, it's as if arguing over, you know, does the core router that this you know goes to, or does my cable modem have a firmware blob? By the time we've gotten to this point, everything's encrypted and and, and wrapped up. We're not really caring so much about what happens there. We have a small chip that we, we designed that uh, acts as a, as a bit of a firewall between the Wi-Fi chip and the trusted domain. And it relays the data to the trusted domain through a single link that we call a comm link. And that is the link, that is the attack surface to keep an eye on um, from a software, software security standpoint. And in addition to that, we have to have some housekeeping things that we have to take advantage of or take manage like uh, you know the, the power charging, the USB interface, whatever it is. These are all in the untrust, untrusted domain uh, and managed by this. Inside the trusted domain, of course, we keep our memory, we keep our flash, we keep our audio codec, we keep the display and the keyboard. Um, we have a mechanism here that we've also put kind of specific to the hardware for a self-destruct. If you have some battery back AES keys and you want to go ahead and just erase everything very quickly, you can activate that. Um, that's all in the trusted domain. And this diagram helps us think about what the attack surfaces are and what we really need to pay attention to. So if we were to go back to that circuit board diagram and sort of look at it from the attack surfaces to the to the T domain, we have to worry about you know people injecting glitches on GPIO, people trying to do you know uh, attacks through USB. You know how do we isolate that? The keyboard, the audio interface. You know there's obviously a debug port because we're all developers that has to be glued shut and sealed if you want to be even secure. And you know we have a com bus going to the untrusted domain, which is through a set of buried traces. Um, so this 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 helps us sort of now decompose, not just verifying it from like, oh my God, what is this crazy thing we're looking at? But ideally, we, we're now able to reason about what are the important things to look at and, and what should we pay attention to as we verify. So we prioritize our limited resources and actually, um, you know, look at the things that matter for verification. Now, finally, let's sort of talk about the hardest problem, which is how do we get to evidence-based trust on the CPU? Or I often refer to it as a system on chip because we have basically one large block in the middle that is an FPGA and it contains all the functions, right? Um, and as I alluded to earlier, silicon instruction is typically de destructive. There is that one typographic X-ray machine I talked about that's the size of the building, but there are less, there are smaller solutions, you know, sort of, you know, desktop sized microscope solutions for inspecting chips, but those are all typically destructive because you have to delay the chip. As you can see here, like, you know, this, this, this is a great sort of, you know, demo of what you can see on a chip, but they cut the chip, right? You know, they literally had to slice through the chip to get this. So the chip doesn't work anymore, right? You can verify this chip all you want, but you know, good luck using it, right? Um, so it's very difficult to check and use a specific chip. So the solution we're, we've come up with for this generation is to use an FPGA. It's a field programmable gate array. So when they say field, they mean like users in the field as opposed to in the lab. Um, I, I was always confused because I, I had more of a bit of a physics background. I was like field programmable, maybe they're using electric fields or whatever. So it means like field as in like, you know, field applications engineer. Um, so the um, 
you know, it, if an FPGA, for people who aren't familiar with it, it's basically a large array of logic and wires. So just individual registers and some lookup tables, and they can be user configured to implement the hardware design of your choice, right? And the idea behind the FPGA is you can sort of narrow that talk to gap, that time of check to time of use gap by compiling your own system on chip, right? And so the idea is that if anyone can compile the designs from source, we can once again enable that trust transfer mechanism to be like software. And so the system in particular we're using is this Python-based system to describe hardware. It's called Megan. Um, and we basically create a, a set of Python arrays that you know, sort of uh, map into a uh, Verilog uh, set of, of statements. And then those flow into various uh, place and route tools that then go to the actual hardware itself. There is a subtlety in that the toolchain openness is not yet 100% on everything, um, but you know there's a actually a really big team of people working on solving that problem as well. And we have other other cool techniques like bitstream inspection that can help mitigate uh, the issue of the toolchain. Um, now, FPGA has a has a feature that makes it a little bit more like um, ASLR for hardware. So for people who are familiar with mitigations and software, there's this thing called outer space layout randomization. So is that even if you have an exploit and someone managed to get inside your computer, finding the location of stack or finding the location of a library or something like this is not as simple as loading a hard-coded constant in and then jumping to it, right? And so you can do a similar technique for FPGAs where you sort of randomize where the actual things go. So if we have like the critical uh, section, like you know the, the decoder for the program counter, or whatever it is, right? You know, if you just change a, ra a random seed, you can actually end up with that particular logic cell being located in a different spot. So if someone was to try and be nefarious and build a backdoor into the FPGA, they would need to, um, you know, sort of literally make a huge uh, change to the chip. Like they would have to basically insight every single one of those uh, small logic cells, in, in include logic that would be a backdoor to try and capture the potential random location of, 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 a, of a key bit. <clears throat> that would actually um, morphologically change the die size grossly, right? It would actually be a much larger piece of silicon. So now we're not needing to go to a big microscope to verify. We can just go to an x-ray machine, look at the silicon die, say, ah, the silicon die is the right size. Therefore, we can at least say it doesn't have like a very powerful exploit built into it that can view all of the bits. Maybe we have um, some smaller level exploits that can be in specific areas. But also sort of the cool is that the cool thing is, is that like, you know, if we do uh, sort of discover these smaller exploits, we can actually reconstruct the bitstream as a countermeasure to it. So we're no longer in the realm of like, you know, we're screwed. We don't know what to do because we have some problem in our hardware. It's actually as we find problems, we can go ahead and patch and mitigate, which which greatly changes the calculus in the game. Um, so and th another thing I had alluded to earlier is that we can close the loop around the, the, the generated bitstream. There's a project called PRJ. PRJ X-ray, Project X-ray. Um, you can, it's on GitHub. You can check it out here. Um, and it basically, it's it it it's been sort of fuzzing the um, bitstream of the FPGA series that I used for Precursor, and they're 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 teasing out what every single bit in that bitstream does. So now it's possible to do sort of a post compilation check to sanity check where key functions are doing. Like did are are the you know AES blocks actually correct and you know are the key management ROMs you know you know having no backdoors we can actually sort of start to build tools that do that at a software level and not having to use a microscope to sort of figure it out. So at the end of the day, the FPGA's biggest potential advantage is that it moves the point of check towards the user. One can imagine that we have a bitstream checker we, or we have like maybe someday a one-click tool to go ahead and compile and verify the bitstream. Um, we don't, we're not there yet today. I want to clarify this is a, sort of a vision of where, where we want to go, but I do think it's doable. This is not like a, a completely crazy, you know, uh, unobtainium thing um, where we, we want everyone to have a tychographic, you know, x-ray machine by their house or something like that to solve the problem. So um, now I've talked a bit about why we're using an FBJ. Let's have a quick look on the inside of what we're putting into it, right? And so this is a this is a maybe a, I don't know how it's rendering you know, on the internet and if people's screen resolution is high enough, but we'll go through block by block so you don't have to stare at this too hard. Um, but the idea is that we have a few major blocks. We have like the core complex. We have some I/O blocks. We have a cryptogra cryptography complex. 
a debug block. Um, and, uh, and when you actually compile this onto the FPGA, this is kind of what it looks like, right? So this is actually one of the views of the tool. This block here is actually a, a almost literal map of the shape of the silicon. And um, I've highlighted what these different things look like after they've gone through a place and route tool. And of course, every time you recompile it, the, ch the shape changes slightly. Like I said, there's, there's a bit of ASLR going here. But you can see how big the things roughly are. Like, you know, the actual CPU core is actually quite small. And the crypto functions take up the bulk of the space inside the chip. Um, so now going back to the uh, sort of the, the logical diagram, we have, um, you know, the core complex, that's what I call. It's a it's a single core RISC-V CPU that's using the RV32 iMac um, instruction set. And we've added an MMU to it because we think that even though it's a very small footprint device, uh, we want the security properties that the MMU brings inside our OS. Uh, we're using the VEX RISC V implementation. It's done, um, it's made in Europe. Um, and the it's got a small also on-chip boot ROM and RAM uh, to help with some housekeeping functions. And um, and we use a tool called LIDEX for integration. So a little bit more on each of these things. Uh, the VEX RISC V, you can actually go to um, um, this GitHub repo and you can like look at the source code for the CPU. So this here, like, you know, I've oftentimes wondered like why, why how do we know that there isn't an opcode that isn't mapped that does something interesting, right, to your CPU. So you can go to this repo and you can sort of see the mapping of the opcodes to the functions, which is really neat. And also likewise, you can add opcodes if you want that are important to you uh, by modifying and, and forking the design. Also like really important to note, this just happened recently, um, like uh, the, the maintainer of the project uh, dropped me an email. I was like, oh, by the way, we found this problem with a privilege, class, pri pri privilege crossing in one of the, um, the, the control status register plugins, right? And if this were a closed source CPU and this was found in the wild after a ship, it would have a named, it would be like a named exploit, like the zombie load or specter. It'd be like, you know, one of those things that you would read about on the, on the tech news or whatever it is, right? But on an open source CPU, it was an email, a commit and a patch, and we've just sort of solved this problem of a privilege crossing um, in one of the harder pieces that it's actually, you know, pretty a little obscure and hard to find. So I think that's like that's like, you know, I, I actually look forward to seeing more and more sort of security review and patching happening at this level. We can actually have a conversation about this, which is really exciting to me that we can we can we can we can do things like this now. Um, a little bit more about LIDEX, which is the framework that we use to put together the SOC. It's a really powerful system on chip integration framework. It's made by um, um, you know, Florent, um, and he's also look, he's located in France. Um, it's uh, it, his GitHub repo is here, it's Enjoy Digital. Uh, like as I mentioned before, it's all written in Megan, which is a it's based on Python and outputs Verilog. Um, and uh, I've included on the right-hand side sort of example of what the, um, sorry, oops. Uh, of what the the number of arguments and sort of customizations you can have on the SOC core. You can kind of just glance over at the list and it's mind boggling how many things you can add to it. But uh, the high point here is that like, like if you don't like what I'm putting in as the reference design, you can do what you want, right? Like if you can put a multi-core of XFIS in there, two, three, four cores, whatever you want, a rocket CPU, you can do Pico RV32, this, uh, um, you know, Orc 1KX, you can do Minerva, I think it's a PowerPC implementation, LM32. There's a whole bunch of different CPUs that you can swap in by just, there's this little string here, CPU type, you actually just change it to the type that you want and recompile and you'll get a sock out that has that CPU that you want. Or you write your own CPU and, and extend it, right? And it supports multiple bus types, AXI, Wishbone, CSR, it has multi-master capability in the buses and debug modes, logic analyst, it's really powerful. Um, and, it's, and it's pretty cool to, to have been developing with this. Um, we have uh, also inside the chip um, a debug complex. So it allows us to do remote debugging. Of, obviously, if, when you go into the secure configuration, you would just compile this out so it wouldn't exist because it's a, it's a huge black backdoor. Um, but uh, you know, we, it, gi it gives us the ability to basically uh, use a desktop host to sort of uh, debug and develop for all of the IO cores um, on the inside. We have a bunch of um, I/O functions uh, that are built in to the device. You know, sort of, uh, they're called. We call them the CSR-based I/O. These are sort of simple I/O for housekeeping. So we have I squared C. We have some interrupt pins. The keyboard uh, matrix is on here. Power control. 
Uh, we have JTAG, self JTAG inspection revealed so that we can go ahead and provision the e-fuses, uh, analog digital converter for power management, uh, debug UART, these types of things, as well as the comm spies here. Um, we also have memory mapped I.O., which is a sort of a higher performance version of the I.O., and here we hang things like the external RAM, which is 16 megabytes, which is, you know, admittedly, it's a small amount of RAM, but that was actually a very deliberate, inter uh, a de very deliberate choice made so that we're not writing code bases that are uninspectable. There's no point in you building a very trustable device and then throwing, I don't know, for example, Linux on it, which has so many lines of code and so many patches to it, I can't even keep up with it, right? So it's deliberately designed for a smaller attack surface OS, like a like a RTOS uh, type of environment. Um, audio codec, uh, flash memory, uh, right now 128 megabytes of, of embedded storage and the LCD controller also exists on this bus. And then we also have a cryptography complex because you know we want to be able to do crypto work. Um, you know, people who don't want to do crypto work can just compile it out, but we offer AES, SHA-512, SHA-2 cores, and we have a Curve 25519 accelerator, um, a key storage ROM. Uh, we have a couple of, actually a couple of TRNGs that are built into the system. And we also are careful to tie down some internal debug buses so that we make sure that there's no accidental exploits or something like this that can turn on uh, uh, buses that we didn't explicitly specify to be off. Uh, a little bit more about the Curve 25519 engine. This is, a, this is a thing that actually also came out of the project. It's a full 256 bit wide modular arithmetic, arithmetic ALU um, that's built into the system. So in addition to that VEX core, um, which, you, which I showed on the slide, you can see here, the VEX is sort of like this uh, red area here. The curve 25519 is huge, right? It's, it's you know as big or bigger than the CPU um, because it's 256 bits. It, it, it's a very simple pipeline. It can do the field multiply uh, operation in 52 cycles and includes normalization of the of the of the of the result uh it's about a 40x speed up on montgomery scalar multiplication which is a core operation in the divi hellman key exchange goes from about 100 milliseconds in software down to about 2.3 milliseconds um uh, using the hardware accelerator and the, the part of the reason we spent so much effort on this is you know we want people to be able to secure messaging which involves the double ratchet which uses lots and lots of these operations and so if you're waiting 100 milliseconds you know, you know, the UI glitch for 100 milliseconds while the ratchet completes, that's not good. So we've got a hardware accelerator to go ahead and um, allow us to accomplish that. You can read more about the docs uh, at a link here. We, it's, act, it's all full open source. You can, um, of, of course, download it and um, modify it and use it for your own. Uh, we have a pair of actually uh, TRNGs on the device. So we have a, a, a small um, actual discrete TRNG. It's off chip. Uh, made with discrete components. And the concept of this was that it's easy to verify, like literally we can put a, uh, an oscilloscope on it and confirm that it's actually behaving well, right? But the problem also is that it's easy to tamper with. Um, you know, the fact that you can point an oscilloscope probe at it means someone, you know, an evil maid or something like this can come into your device, open it up and maybe you know, short out a point when you weren't looking or something. Um, and so as a backup, we have inside the SOC itself, uh, ring oscillator based TRNG, which is harder to verify because you can't see it, we can't probe it, um, but it's also harder to tamper with at the end of the day. The idea is that you just XOR those two together so you get a little bit of defense and depth uh, depending upon your attack scenario. Um, so, uh, and the, so the, you know, sort of in summary, um, you know, precursor, the idea is that we want to build a thing that embodied these three principles for evidence based trust in hardware, right? You know, we're trying to avoid complexity. We try to build a full system, so it's not just like we're handing you a circuit board or just a chip. It's a full end-to-end -end solution for your secrets from your fingertips to your eyes. And uh, we're doing it in a very open fashion so that users can uh, sort of be empowered to verify and seal their hardware. And so the idea is that we want to close this time of check, time of use gap. You remember this, this attack you know, service issue that, 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 that I illustrated before, so that you know you, uh, can go ahead and verify some parts and we can teach people how to verify things if they want to do themselves um, And if, if you aren't the type of person who really wants to put all the effort into the verification um, a Sort of a design goal is to make it so that ideally within maybe, uh, you know, two orders of separation uh, Two degrees of separation you, you can find a friend or trusted friend who can vouch for it for you I don't 
want to build systems that are so complicated that you have to send to a third party system, uh, service and there's only a couple of them and they're regulated by the government or whatever it is to check. I actually re personally prefer to have uh, people who have the same values of me, who are in my friend's network um, to be able to verify things. And I think that's that's actually sort of fundamentally how human trust works is that you know the people who are doing it and you know their intents are good. Um, and that's actually at the end of the day, what's most important uh, in, in, in trust. So uh, the current development status of, of the of the project is that we're we've got hardware. Uh, we're actually starting crowdfunding. Um, there's a, there's a, a a link now that's live. You can go to and learn a whole lot more about the device and um, even uh, potentially you know get in line to be the first ones to receive it when it ships in about a year. Um, the uh, and um, we also have um, a software stack that's in progress. So we've actually we're designing our own OS. It's Rust based um, and it's called Zeus. It's by a guy named Sean Zobs Cross. It's now booting. We're, we're we've got message passing working and logging, all these sorts of things, and we're, we're now sort of like trying to push it up into the level where it's useful for UX and applications. Um, I also want to give a quick shout out to Enelnet uh, and the NGI Zero uh, project um, for uh, giving us funding, which allowed us to sort of spend the last couple of years developing uh, this project without having to deal with sort of the pressure of crowdfunding and, and sort of the politi politics that come from that. So I really appreciate that. Thank you guys. Um, and that's basically it for the presentation. Um, like I said, you can go to um, CrowdSupply. There's a quick URL at the bottom, precursor.dev. You can visit if you want to, uh, if you're interested in finding out more about it, um, all the information is there. And my Twitter handle is at Bunny Studios. You can tweet me as well later on. Uh, and I think we can open this up to questions. I was told uh, I should end it this time and, and take some questions. Yes, indeed. Thanks for a, a great uh, talk, Bunny. Uh, we have gotten some questions from the from the YouTube audience. Mm -hmm. The first one, the first one is: uh, What do you think about the idea of delaying some syscalls as a way to make the CPU more secure? Uh, delaying syscalls has been implemented as a defense against Spectre. Oh, okay, so timing attacks and these types of things. Yeah, I think that um, actually, uh, personally, my I, so delaying syscalls is a, is a, is an interesting way to encapsulate. Say you have a black box on the inside, and it and it emits some timing side channel, right? And you're trying to essentially say we're going to just snap time to equal increments. So you're sort of rubbing out the 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 footprint, the time footprint of computation. The hope actually with a, a, a system as open as Precursor is that we can still keep the optimizations in place, but we can, but because it's open, we can actually reason about the secure paths. And so now we, we don't have to turn off branch prediction. We don't have to turn off caches. We don't have to not do these syscalls because the compiler can actually say, this is the microarchitecture of the device. And we can prove that this code does not have a side channel it with a lot of extra compiler analysis and some other caveats, that sort of thing. That's actually, I would, I, you know, and it doesn't, we can't, we're, we're not there today, but that's the, I think the promise of openness is that we could get there. Um, and so, yes, I, I think if we, of course, if we can't get there, then delaying syscalls can be a way to sort of rub out the side channel information. But uh, ideally, we're getting to a point where we don't have to make these performance loss things because we're so open, we can actually reason about this code not having side channels in it. All right, yeah. That makes sense to me, at least. But I was not the one <laughs> writing yeah, the question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, another question is uh, regarding what, what the scope of Precursor is. Uh, what is your take on email? Is it regarded as the web browser, as in out of scope? Or <laughs> would, you, would you rather view it as uh, something like secure text messaging, which is in scope? Uh, I, think, I think, you know, you, e email is, I think it fits within the footprint of the device computationally. Um, I think the issue kind of more with email is that it's hard to get safe defaults on it that that don't essentially leak everything anyways to the, the email provider, right? The email itself is not by default encrypted. Um, it, you know, it's, it's tricky to get right. Um, the reason why I like secure messaging is that we now have protocols and contact management things that have safe defaults. And, and so, and so part of the the push for Precursor was to build a device eventually that I called a system that I call Be Trusted. Some people may have heard of this. Um, and they're actually related. So Precursor is just the hardware platform. And Be Trusted is the larger with the software on top of it 
thing that would be a secure solution for people who aren't tech savvy. Like I don't, you just, you shouldn't have to be a hacker to be able to configure your email uh, and know that, you know, someone's not reading it partway through. And even, I mean, even though I try my best to try and try to lock things down, I just UI mistakes and you're, you're brain fart and then you just send without hitting, hitting the encrypt button or something. And then you're, you know, okay, well that the whole thread's gone, right? Oops. Right. It's like, you know, email, email is hard from a user standpoint, so, but it's not out of scope. The short answer is not out of scope. It's just the reason why we didn't pick it initially is that it's um it's hard to get right. Um, but I I, I, I people are, I'm, I think people could very realistically port uh, that application to the framework. All right. Yeah. Uh, there's uh, another question here, uh, which regards uh, a camera. What about having a camera, for example, mm. for reading QR codes? I mean, not yeah. for general photography, but just to yes. Just to ease the input in certain cases. Yes, yes, uh, very good question. Thought about that a lot. Um, it's possible, um, uh, and actually, the the actual precursor device itself breaks out some extra GPIOs into the battery compartment. So, and and I did a little bit of background checking of, on things. It's it's wired up so you could potentially take a CSI interface and 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 as an extension, a hacker extension, sort of swap out the flex PCB and put a camera on it. Right, um, so it it definitely has the capability to be extended there. But the reason I didn't want to throw in at this level is, is we work so hard to really delineate the attack surfaces within a trusted domain, and pulling the camera into the trusted domain sort of breaks that that symmetry I have around around the attack surfaces. Right, um, I think that there's certainly people who can you know they know what they're doing, they accept the risk. Um, you know, they feel comfortable with with the sort of the complexity of the camera chips. And the other thing is the camera chips are just insanely complicated. If you ever take one apart and see what's on the inside and the amount of even the firmware that runs inside the camera chip, it uh, it can be it can be a little daunting. So uh, it may it may be a thing that later on you could you could support. It's not ruled out, but I didn't put it in initially just because I can't I can't find it. I couldn't source a camera that I could trust basically. All right. Yeah. Uh... Uh, but maybe then it would be possible to do some kind of uh, simplistic camera thing that only reads QR codes or something like that. Basically. Yeah, possible. There, there's, uh, there's some, I think there's some options. Uh, the other sort of complexity in, in the camera supply chain is that um, it's it's actually, they're, they're basically just built for mobile phones. And so the models keep swapping out every like few months. And then it's, you know, they all, you basically can't buy a dumb camera. They're going to be high end fast cameras because that's where the market is, right? And so that market has, anyways, it's a, it's a good idea is what I'm saying. Um, and it's a thing that I, you know, I have pondered, um, but, and, but this, these are some of the thoughts I've gone through my head in thinking about it. All right. Yeah. Uh, I, I had another question uh, from, from myself was uh, okay, sure. this uh, FPGA programming. Is there no proprietary firmware in the FPGA to handle the programming of it? Or is that what this uh, PRJ X-ray helps with? Uh, so the actual literal programming of the FPGA is a state machine, uh, and it's it's pretty well documented. Um, there's part of the reason I'm going with this particular FPGA is that it has been studied by academics up and down. Literally, people have looked at it under a microscope um, and found all kinds of exploits and all kinds of problems. But they're known. We know what the issues are in the programming mechanism, as opposed to some of the other FPGAs, which may even be more secure in the programming mechanism, but we don't know, we don't ha we haven't looked at it yet. And so, uh, but basically it's a very simple state machine that has a bitstream format that's defined. Um, all the tools that we use to generate the bitstream are open. We can re-encrypt the bitstreams, we can inspect them with these open tools. Um, and so, you know, to, to that extent, I feel, fairly comfortable that we haven't sort of, you know, I don't, you don't have to buy the special box from Xilinx that is closed source has a blob on the inside that does the loading for you. It's like, you know, we can through the Python code step through it and I can show you, here's where the bits go. You can look on a microscope or on, a on an oscilloscope and confirm everything is in line. All right, yeah, that's kind of nice. Um, all right, uh, I don't think we have any more questions from uh, from the YouTube stream right now. Um, okay. In that case, thank you very much for the talk. It was uh, way more in depth than I would ever, so I, I couldn't understand. <laughs> <laughs>
Sorry. Yeah, but it's very interesting to dive deep in something that uh, you're not dealing with yourself. So, so okay. thanks a lot. Cool. Yeah. Great to and, see you guys. Yeah. And I see that we already have Simon uh, lined up, but I think we have five minutes left until uh, we're about to start that, right? Yeah. So we'll go to a short pause. So refill your coffees and uh, we'll be back at 10. Okay. See you guys. Thanks. See you. Thank you.